Hello friends and gamers and welcome to the Fortress. My name is Jinx and I'm back again with the Campaign Medal Award system for Global War 1936 version 3 for the Tournament of the Spring Offensive 2021. So these campaign ribbons are a way in which we'll be able to keep track of who attended the tournament, which nation you played, how well you did, if your alliance won, and which it, which tournament it was. <laughs> I'm posting these on the YouTube so that I can get as much feedback as I possibly can, so that I can improve the game, uh, improve these rules behind this, and make it work absolutely swimmingly well, and it'll be universally accepted with all the bugs worked out as much as possible. I want to express my gratitude to those individuals who have who've given me their feedback, Trig, uh, Liam Borowski, Edelwolf, and Madman Dan. I really appreciate your guys' feedback on this, and it really means a lot to me to try to get things sorted out as quick as possible. And also your suggestions for alternatives and things, I really do appreciate it. So without further ado, let's get into what the campaign ribbons actually are. The campaign ribbon will be a unique ribbon for each tournament. It will have a number attachment that will count the annual tournaments. The number attachment begins at 1 in 2021, and it will count up from there. You'll have three ribbons attached to a bar on your chest. And so the second ribbon is the Prestige ribbon. It shows how many accomplishments the player achieved within the game by attaching Prestige stars. One star is fairly basic, and everybody, for the most aware, unless you played really badly, most individuals will have one star. Two stars is going to be pretty much the standard across the board, and everybody will have two stars. Three stars is usually the winning side will have a three star or two but not everybody, and four stars is rare and outstanding achievement. And the way I'm trying to balance this out is in a six-player game, only one player will have a six, uh, four star. That's the way I'm trying to balance it out. In historical terminology, I suppose um, America would have gotten four stars in World War II. Most other people would have uh, you know, two stars, with the exception being perhaps um, Russia getting three stars, and perhaps Germany getting a three star there as well. But everybody else, about two stars. Uh, maybe Britain as well, a three star. But you get the picture. The national ribbon shows which nation was played by the recipient. It may have a gold or silver star attachment depending if the nation won first, second, or third place. Third place being blank with no um, star. It may further have an oak leaf attachment to symbolize how many major powers are played by the recipient. If it has a bronze oak leaf, it means it played the, the player played two major powers. If it has a gold, it means it's four. You'll only ever see four if there's only one allied player on the table and he manages to play all the allies and manages to evolve the KMT to be a major power as well. Other than that, he'll probably only get a silver oak leaf, one for USA, one for Britain, and one for France. All right, moving on. So everything else in this sheet is set up around the prestige star ribbons. You'll have three options to get a tier one, three options to get a tier two, etc. If you have, somehow don't manage to get your second star or your first star, but do manage to get everything else, you know, in the, in the, say in the case, in this example, if you don't get your second star, but you get your first star and your third star, well, you only get two stars on your rib ribbon. You won't get your full three stars. So you do have to try to get yourself in all four tiers as much as possible. All right, let's dive into the options. And this is a work in progress, so bear with me. <laughs> okay, in the first tier, we have the Kwangtung Army Special Maneuvers. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of the Japanese turn, the USSR and the Chinese KMT, CCP, and Warlords do not possess any units adjacent to any non-island land zones with a Japanese printed roundel. So that's to represent up here, in Manchuria and Korea. If there are no enemy units in these areas of Primorsky Krai, Amur, Chita, as well as Suyan, Peking, then you will be considering that one as a victory for the... Uh, you, you get your first bronze star. It's not too difficult to get. Either you do a bunch of um, cross-border raids with the Soviets and eventually take out these ones from the Chinese, or you simply wait until they move, the Soviets move away, and you naturally capture the Chinese territory here. So that's the way that would work out. And that's at any point in the game, at the end of any Japanese turn. Now, I don't have anything else for these two tiers here, so advice is welcome. Now on to tier three. The I'm not going to attempt to pronounce this, but the great... East Asian War. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of a Japanese turn, Japan controls all land zones with a printed Chinese KMT, CCP, or Warlord roundel adjacent to a C-zone. So that means, you know, it means kind of a historical Peking, Hopei, Shantung, Hunan, Kwangtung, Hainan, as well as Nanking. So that's the territories a person needs to grab to get this achievement for Tier 2. Not extraordinarily difficult in following a historical pathway. Next up, we have the Indies campaign. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of a Japanese turn, Japan controls all land zones of the Dutch East Indies. 
Sumatra, Borneo, Java, West Timor, Celebes, Malu Maluku Islands, and the Dutch New Guinea. So we'll show you where that is here. That's basically all these ones here. Pretty standard, except not Sarawak. Pretty standard fare right there. <clears throat> Malaluk is going to be a little bit pain in the butt because it has no IPP value, but still, it's one of the requirements to get this tier. Next up, we have Kikaku AU or Operation AU. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of a Japanese turn, Japan controls all the following land zones all Japanese home country and the Anzac land zones of Sydney and New Zealand. Japan has this problem where it's got so much mobility that almost anything is possible for them to achieve they could capture an American territory. They can go across the ocean and capture an American territory. They can go and capture, you know, Vladivostok over here. They can capture Australian territory. They can, if they want to, take out Calcutta and go after the Suez Canal over here in Eastern Egypt. They really don't have many limitations on what they can do because they, their mobility is up high and they also have that surprise attack feature as well just to make things extra interesting where all the aircraft get a plus one and all the defending units get a negative one or all the aircraft get a first strike at the very least and all ships get a movement of plus one too so you know it does get you can do a lot of stuff with that you can capture sydney and new zealand that's not too difficult if you want to set if you want to use that for that right but japan has a thing where you can't do everything you can't take out china as well as go after calcutta as well as go after the indies and as well as go after australia you know, it's limited to what it can do. It's got high mobility, but it's basically, uh, well, one shot or two shots maybe at best, right? You can't do everything that you want to do. Hence, Kikaku, uh, Kikaku AU is here as an option for Tier 2 because it's not extraordinarily difficult to do this, especially if it's on par with this attack against China. It's doable, right? Next up, we have Tier 3, so Operation MI. Gain a prestige star if, at any point during the game, Japan controls all or most of the following land zones for a full game round, from the end of a Japanese turn to the end of the following Japanese turn. Three of the land zones included below can be omitted from this objective. All land zones with the Japanese printed around all, that's a big one, Atu and Kiska Island, Midway, Wake, Mariana, Philippines, Gilbert Islands, Solomon, and Fiji, New Caledonia, New Guinea, Dutch New Guinea, and all Dutch East Indies Islands. So this gets really complex. Um, it's a lot of territory, so that's why that exception has to be three. Let me paint off some of them. I'll have to zoom out for this. Okay, painting in red. We have Atu and Kiska. You have all of the Japanese uh, places with the Japanese roundel, so that's going to make things interesting as well. Corral. You have Midway. There's not Hawaii. But there's Wake. Uh, Marshall Islands is inclu included. G Gilbert Islands. Solomon. Fiji. Not New Hebrides, so that's nice. I think New Caledonia is up there as well. Yeah, New Caledonia, which is right here, as well as, you know, these guys right here, Mariana, and these islands here. So basically the extent of, of um, well, maybe not quite the extent, Philippines over here as well, plus the Dutch islands, as well as New Guinea, I believe. Yeah. New Guinea here, but not Sarawak. So basically, a lot of a lot of territory has to go in a lot of islands. It's pretty difficult to achieve. That's why they have the exception of three. Keep in mind, this is a tier three difficulty. <clears throat> so if Japan manages to grab onto all these and hold it for one turn, they'll have got themselves a tier three difficulty. That's pretty extreme. I forgot to do these islands here. That's a lot of work to do. So with an exception of three, you could probably forget about Atu and Kiska if you want to, maybe Midway, maybe Wake, or maybe you want to grab them so that at the very least, Japan has uh, USA has to grab the few extra territories to actually make it worth their time. Maybe if you grab them all and the Americans come and they grab, you know, one, two, three, four back from you, uh, then you, know, you get the picture. But that, what's, uh, that's what I'm trying to balance here with this one. So maybe the exception needs to be extended to perhaps five, and maybe that's what make it a proper tier four difficulty. So let's see, if we extend it to five, you could say Atu and Kiska is excluded, Midway, Wake, Gilbert and Marshall Islands. You know, that gets us out of range of USA. Now, an idea here as Japan is if you have your fleet parked off in Caroline, uh, Caroline Islands, you could probably hit all of these ones. 
with also scare off one, two, three, four, you could also scare off the Americans to move northwards and further away from this base so that you can use your surprise attack. You know, you if the if the Americans stayed here, you could use your surprise attack against them and take them out. So by placing your ships here, you could actually force them to come to this sea zone or even this sea zone and just hopefully they outlast you. And in that moment you could strike and try to grab all these little islands and hold it for a turn, which you know, if the Americans are out of position here, it might take them a turn to capture this one. And one, two, three, it might take them a turn to capture this one. Actually, they can't even get that far. Ah, oh, yeah, they could. They can capture those two. Right? But there's not too much else they can do beyond that. So that's why I put it at three. But maybe the exception should be up at five. Moving on. The Chongqing Campaign. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of the Japanese turn, Japan controls all or most of the following land zones, except for two all Japanese home country, and all land zones with the printed Chinese KMT, CCP, or Warlord Roundel. So that is a hefty, hefty load of things they need to do as well. So Japanese homeland, of course, are these ones here. I suppose I could zoom in now. And uh, all Chinese territory barring two. Barring two. I had it at three before, but I thought three, well, three, because Yunnan usually holds out quite long. So you have Yunnan, Tibet, and Xinkang. Actually, in my games, I've never seen Yunnan fall. It's always, um, the only reason it would fall is by misplay by the Chinese. So I've always seen the Chinese survive, at least in Yunnan. So that's three territories here. But my thinking was, you know, if you said, yeah, I suppose this would actually work, three territories. But the thing is, I want, Chongqing is here in Yunnan area, I believe. So you, I want the Japanese to wipe out the Chinese as much as possible. So in that case, that's why I have it at two. So the Japanese can come here and take it out. Now I'm still up for debate if perhaps three would work as well in this case, and that way you could take out Yunnan, and then you have these three in the backwards. But it's also, yeah, you get the picture. Two is also nice because that forces... With two, you could actually take out... You're forced to take out Yunnan, and then the Chinese are left with Xinkang and Tibet. That's all they have left over. Because uh, the Chinese may surrender all this backwards stuff and move everything to Yunnan as well. And you don't want them to do that. That's why I have it limited at two. Because I want them to kind of get wiped out completely as much as possible. All right. The Yugo Offensive. Gain a prestige star if, at any point during the game, Japan controls all the following land zones for full game round. From the end of the Japanese turn to the end of the following Japanese turn. All Japanese home country, British Malaya, Siam, Burma, Bengal, Benares, and Calcutta. That is a little bit more to work with. So home country, we know where that's at. As for the rest of it, that's British Malaya, Siam, Burma, Calcutta, and Benares. So last minute inclusion. The idea there is if I don't have Benares included, the Japanese are gonna simply use their first strike or first uh, move to go attack these three, ter uh, these one, two, three, four territories. Usually Burma and Bengal aren't all that well defended either. So it's British Malaya and Calcutta, leaving Benares here in the backwoods. So the fact that Benares is out here means that the Japanese have to wait at least one turn. They have to wait for the, you know, they have to, um, they can move, press on from Calcutta inwards if they want to, right? But it means that it takes them two turns to get it. And that leaves the Allies two turns to get in position to try to take one of them back if they wanted to, right? If the Japanese come in here and sweep in here and Benares isn't included, well, it makes it that much harder for the Allies to capture it back. But since it's now a two-turn process for the Japanese to grab onto and hold onto, it gives the Allies a chance to take one of the territories back. Excellent. Moving on to Tier 4. And so that's for full game round, and you get this Yugo Offensive. Tier 4. The Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere. Gain a prestige star if, at the end of the game, Japan or a member of its alliance control all or most of the following territories, except for three. All territory with an IPP value with a Japanese printed roundel. All territory with this Chinese KMT, CCP, or Warlord printed roundel adjacent to a sea zone. Hong Kong, British Malaya, Burma, and Sarawak. Annam, Tonkin, Cochin China, Siam, New Guinea, and the Philippines, and all Dutch East Indies. So this one is, um, let me quick look. Yeah. This one is, uh, the tier four. So that again is the Dutch islands over here. The Dutch islands are going to be included in that. And then also, what else did we have there? The Philippines, New Guinea, Siam, Cochin China. So 
that basically entails this over here. I'm drawing over this quite a bit, aren't I? British Malaya, Siam, this, and all territory adjacent to C, as well as this stuff here. We also need Marshall Islands as part of it, and the Japanese home islands will also be part of it, as well as this Manchuko area. <laughs> all right. That's what Japan needs to have to have tier four, but they have to hold that till the end of the game Which in my experience is playing with Japan unless America goes all out against Germany, it's quite a bit difficult uh, For Japan to hold on to all this stuff, right? It doesn't take too long and it starts crumbling the American pressure over here makes Japan having have to kind of contract and then in the meantime Australia comes back and starts grabbing some of these islands in the FEC as well. And then the Chinese are knocking on the door as well. So it's difficult to get to tier four. But if you manage to grab onto this and hold it on to the end of the game, that would be a, a nice tier four game to play. So that's that's just my two cents on the matter. It seems to make sense to do it this way. And Operation 21 is something similar. At the end of the game, you have an exception of three. You need to hold all territories with an IPV value. All territories with an IPV value with a printed FEC roundel and Cochin China, uh, sorry, French, uh, what, what are they called? French, Indochina, Siam, and all the Dutch East Indies. So Dutch East Indies play a crucial role in all of this because they had a lot of the resources the Japanese needed to survive. So let me just paint out some of the ones, but it's an emphasis on the Far East command as opposed to um, China. So you grab these territories here. Dutch East Islands again. I don't think the Philippines are included this time around. And about that. That about does the trick. Uh, these ones are off, but you get the idea. As well as the Japanese home islands. So the focus is more on India as opposed to um, China, but that's the scoop there. So a lot of drawing back and forth. You see the scoop of what it's designed for. All territories with an IP value with the printed FEC roundel. And again, the whole idea here is the Americans aren't going to let you get away with all this stuff as well. They're going to come knocking on your door. They're going to first put pressure on the, you know, uh, put pressure on Japan itself. And that allows the ANZAC or the FEC, well, in this case, FEC isn't going to exist, but allows the, Jap uh, the Americans to start grabbing some Dutch East Islands back, as well as some of this other stuff. And then with the Chinese, you know, with the Chinese, without them having any pressure against them, they'll likely start pushing into French Indochina or up here into, um, well, I guess, yeah, this would be part of it as well, up here into Manchuria as well. So you get the scoop. There's a lot that the Chinese, uh, the Japanese have to hold on to to get that tier four star. Not impossible, but doable if they hold on to it to the end of the game. Now, the thing is, all this stuff, it really depends on America, which direction America goes, if it does more of a, a focus on Germany or if it does a more focus on Japan. In my experience, in my experience, it seems to be that Japan has a tough time to get to this level, <laughs> to hold on to it, to this length of the game. But that's just my two cents. Okay, give me your feedback on what you think about the Japanese stuff, and also some suggestions for the two-tier-one stuff I have empty here. Thank you all for watching. Cheers!